Good. Good morning, West Side. Uh, for those of you who have come to this church in the last 24 years, uh, may not have realized that uh, I preached here for 18. I figured out the other day that I preached probably somewhere around 1,700 sermons from this pulpit. Uh, those uh, were the days when we had church on Sunday night. So in case you don't know who I am, my name is Garth Black. Uh, I retired 24 years ago, and Doris and I could have moved any place, anywhere. But since the temperature stays pretty much in the mid 70s year round, we decided to stay here. It is funny, isn't it? <laughs> but we, uh, we've been very blessed. The reason we stayed is because this is our family. It was our family then, it's our family now. God has blessed us so very much. Uh, this church is, I think, the fifth church that I preached for during my 42 years of being a minister, pulpit minister. But I can tell you that uh, we've loved this place and we love this family. And it's been a blessing to us all these years. You know, the real reason I stayed is because everybody told me that I could not die until I did their funeral. <laughs> and I've done close to 300, I think, since I've been here. Amazing. But God has blessed us. If you've been baptized into Christ and trust in him, serve him, you have two precious gifts above all the gift of his son, the gift of forgiveness, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38, Peter said, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and you receive the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The two most precious gifts of all. But it's good as the Bible to guide us, lead us, comfort us, lift us up. Teach us how to live our lives. He's given us the church, our family. He's given us the gift of prayer. But this morning I want to talk to you about another gift. The gift of living without fear. All of us live and have lived with fear. Fear is worry, anxiety, stress. That's fear. The opposite of fear, the opposite of fear is peace, tranquility, a peace of mind, no worries. Ah, what it would be like to have no worries. But that's one of the things that God promises us, the ability to live without fear. And truly he has blessed our lives in this respect. I want to talk to you about what fear means. On the screen you see rejection. I put rejection first because I think that rejection is probably the greatest fear we live with. Understand this. Fear is one of Satan's greatest weapons. He uses it to discourage us, to depress us. And oftentimes that depression leads to even suicide. Recently I heard a statistic that said every day of the year, 180 people in this country commit suicide. That's over 67,000 suicides a year. 
That's more men than we lost in 10 years of the Vietnam War. Why? We give in. We don't understand as Christians what we have in Christ. So I put rejection up there as number one. Let me explain to you what I mean by rejection. It could begin with the child, age five, six, seven, eight. Mom or dad says, you're just stupid. You're never going to amount to anything. You're a loser. And unfortunately, there are some families that's the way parents talk to their children. That's rejection. The child goes to school, no friends, nobody at the car, the, the table with them in the cafeteria at lunchtime. Pick, picking uh, sides, picking sides at recess to play a game. You always pick last. That's rejection. Rejection continues into the teenage years in which we're, we're not accepted by our peers. Then teenagers turn to doing things that they know are, is wrong, but they'll do anything, anything to gain acceptance. And how sad that is. Then we get married. Successful marriages succeed, I think, basically for two reasons. Number one, emotional needs being met. By that I mean these five words. To feel needed, to feel wanted, appreciated, respected, and desired. I've never seen a marriage fail in all my life of counseling in which those two people, husband and wife, met each other's emotional needs. When we don't meet each other's emotional needs, that's a form of rejection and brings a total destruction to a marriage. Relationships that we have with others, rejected in, with our coworkers, our next door neighbors, our own families maybe as we grow older. Those are ways that we experience rejection. Then there's failure. We fail to try something because we're afraid. I was in Russia a couple of times back in the mid 90s after the fall of the, of the wall in Berlin and the breakdown of communism, went with Nat Cooper. Nat Cooper was a missionary that we supported for almost 20 years. Still lives in Lubbock, heard from him the other day on Facebook, he's doing well. Of the flags that you see in the foyer or countries that Nat visited and some others, a few, all where we did mission work as a church and supported him as he traveled around the world. But when I was in Russia, I taught teachers. I couldn't teach the Bible, but I did, but they didn't realize it was from the Bible. We were there to teach teachers. So I was a month in Siberia, lower central Siberia on the first trip. And the second trip I went to Kazan which is 500 miles east of Moscow. And for a month, we taught teachers. I taught them how to build self-esteem in their students and themselves, in their children, and in their family relationships. But one day, a teacher asked me if I would speak to her 11th and 12th graders. And I said, well, I'll speak to anything you want. I didn't realize what door I'd opened. She said, I'd like for you to speak to them about failure. They've grown up under communism, as have their parents and grandparents. They're failed, they are afraid to try anything for the consequences of the, if they fail. I can't get them to even stand up before a class and speak. 
I can't get them to try new things. Would you talk to them about failure? And so I spent an hour helping them to understand how to conquer failure. One of the ways that we experience failure sometimes is if you're asked to speak publicly, I understand that 90% of the people in our country would be afraid to stand up before a group of 500 people and uh, speak for 20 minutes, let's say. They would be totally afraid to do that. Why? Because they would think they would fail. We'll talk more about it later. Then there are losses. The fear of losing our jobs, the fear of losing a loved one in death or some other way, some separation. Losing maybe our home, couldn't pay the mortgage. We fear losses. Unfortunately, we experience them more often than not. Then there is the matter of outliving our safety. As you grow older, there's a couple of things that are very special. We fear that we'll outlive our that we'll outlive our savings. We won't have enough money. I heard of a couple one time that nobody lived past 80. So they figured that they knew they'd budget their money to 80. Well, at age 80, they were still alive and they were out, out of money. So that was a bad plan. The second thing is, is that we are fear of losing our health, particularly as we get older, that I won't be able to do what I used to do. And that would be a great concern to me. I understand that problem really well. I tell people who say, how are you doing, Garth? And I say, you don't have enough time for me to tell you. But I'm, I'm really well in, I think, not in body necessarily, but still in my mind. And God has blessed me in that way, thank God. And then there's the fear of death, the fear of dying, the uncertainty. Will I or will I not go to heaven? And so many Christians fear dying needlessly because they don't understand the confidence that they ought to have in going to heaven if they serve Christ. And then there is the concerns and the fact, worries we have about the happiness, the success, and the health of those that we love. And that's, that's certainly a common situation. Because we love our family, we love our children, we love others, and we're concerned about others. But concern is fine. Don't let it turn into worry or anxiety or above all, fear. The rest of our time together today, I want to talk about three ways that all of us can overcome fear. First of all, let me tell you this. God does not want you to fear anything. He doesn't want you to waste 10 seconds in worry or anxiety or stress. Stress, anxiety, fear can shorten your lives. It can lead to a to cancer and other diseases in your body. One of our young ladies here years ago, Alison Masako, was Alison Little. She is Shirley Pitts' sister. She is Janet Pafford's sister. She wrote her dissertation. She's a degree, a doctor's degree in psychology. She wrote her thesis on the relationship between stress, anxiety, and cancer. And her conclusion in that research was that very definitely 
there is a correlation between disease, such as cancer and other things, depression, mental illness, because of fear. God does not want us to fear. Jesus said, do not fear. Paul says, do not fear. Peter said in the fifth chapter of 1 Peter, have no anxiety. Let God help you. We need to learn how to deal with the fears and the anxiety that we encounter in our daily lives because it can easily turn us against God. We'll doubt God. We'll doubt his power, his strength, his help, or the power of prayer, or the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's not what God wants for us. So let me, let me suggest, look on the, look at 1 John chapter 4, uh, 4 verse 18. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. No one who fears is not made perfect or mature in love. What does all that mean? How does love help us conquer fear? And what does it mean that fear has to do with punishment? Well, fear has to do with consequences and they're negative. And I just expressed some of them a moment ago. Our lifespan, our health. How does love help us overcome fear? That's what I talked about to those Russian students. This very passage. Love has one characteristic above all. It is concerned with others before self. If I love you, if I love you, that I'm going to be more interested in you than I am in me. If I love you, I will do anything for you. You will be first. My focus will be on you. Let me give you an example. Think of this scenario. There's a house in your block. It's about midnight. And you hear the sound of fire trucks. You go outside and you see what's going on and there's a house that's burning up. The first is two stories. The first floor is filled with fire. They're putting, trying to put the fire out with fire hoses. In front is a lot of people, including the family. And all of a sudden, on the second story window, at the far end, a seven-year-old boy sticks his head out the window and screams, Mommy, Mommy, save me. And the mother heads for the front door. And the fireman grabs her and says, Ma'am, you cannot go in that house. As sure as you take a step, you're dead. It's a furnace in there. You can't do it. Why is the mother not afraid? Why is she not afraid to go in that burning house? One reason, love for her child. The focus is on the child. Do you realize that most of our fears, the ones I described just a moment ago, are oftentimes self-focused. We think about how a loss, a failure, a rejection will affect me. Me, 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 me. It's always about me. If we love, it's not about me. If somebody rejects me, instead of being angry, instead of being upset, instead of being rebellious and difficult, we decide how can I help this person 
love instead of acting the way they are. If somebody criticizes me, cuts me down, instead of being angry with them, kill them with love. Focus on what you can do for them, not what you don't get. We're going to have rejection in life. There's no question about it. You're going to fail. You don't, you're not perfect. And so how do you deal with those things? Well, one of the ways is, is that you're not self-centered. You're focusing on others, not me. Paul says in Philippians 2, consider others before you consider yourselves. And then he gives the example of Jesus. How Jesus came to this earth. Paul says, the Lord did not count being on equality with God, something to hold on to, something to grasp, something to keep. He emptied himself and became a man, a servant who died on the cross for each of us. Talk about focus. Talk about love. God's focus was on our well-being, our, our being forgiven. There's no other way to forgiveness except through the blood of Jesus. If he had not died for us, we would have no hope, no hope. Focus on others. Think in terms of giving, not receiving. There's too much selfishness in this world. Too many people that are think just of self. As long as you're thinking of just self, you're going to suffer anxiety because the focus is in the wrong place. You know, one of the, the, one of the ways that we fear, as I said a moment ago, is public speaking. When I lived in Rome, New York for 10 years and helped establish the church there back in the, the late 50s and early 60s, I taught in a the junior college that was there in the evenings. I taught world history and I taught speech. Most of my students had stage fright. Oh, they were afraid to get up in front of people. So I taught them how to overcome stage fright. I told them that don't focus on yourself. Don't think about what you're wearing or whether or how you're going to look whether they're going to think you're ugly or good looking or whatever. Don't think about how they're going to criticize your remarks. Just think about what it is that you have to share with them and then focus on three people. One on this side, one in the middle, and one over here. And when you focus on other people and how they're reacting to what you're saying, You'll not be afraid anymore because the focus is no longer on you. Stage fright is a result of self-focus. Think of them. Think of your audience. And you will be successful. And they were. The second thing I want to call to your attention Let me see where I want to be. Is let go and let God. Let me read to you what am I, it's on the screen. Do not be anxious or worrisome about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What's he saying? He's saying to us that when we have a problem of anxiety, or we're truly worried about something, do what you can do. 
If a child is sick, take the child to the doctor. Once you've done that, that's all you can do, maybe. And you let go and you let God handle it. I am convinced that all of us as human beings have no concept about the power of God. You realize God created the universe? Billions of stars. With the snap of his fingers, he created this universe. He created Earth, a little tiny planet in a solar system among the billions of other stars. He created us. He created everything on this Earth. The beauty of Earth. The beauty of man. He created us. And he says if we'll trust him, and if we are his disciples, servants of God, heirs with Christ, he will respond to our petitions. He is saying to us in everything, with your petition and with thanksgiving, then ask, God, I need your help. I need strength. I need the power to resist turning to fear, turning to, to my doubts, anxieties, living with stress every, every day. What did Jesus say? He said, trust in God, trust also in me. Peter says, turn your anxieties over to God. Let God be your source of power and help. When I lived in Rome, New York, for the first three years, we lived in a house before we were able to have the money to build a church building. Two-story house, Doris and I lived on the upstairs. They had made the downstairs dining room and living room into a place you could assemble where we had church services. Out in front of that house, there were two large, uh, I would call them walls, on each side of the eight or nine steps up to the front porch. And these walls were about six feet high with a concrete top. And after church, the kids, it wasn't in winter time, we got 140 inches of snow there every year. And the kids loved the snow. I had to shovel it. I didn't like it quite so much. Anyway, the kids would get on that, that top of that wall about a foot and a half wide, six, eight feet long and six feet high. And they would run down that runway and leap into the air and dad would catch them. Time and time again, the kids would run and the dads would take turns in catching the kids. And they were just spread eagle six feet high. They had the ground below them. No fear whatsoever. Daddy is going to catch me. Isn't that interesting? They were not afraid. Daddy will save me. Jesus said, to the apostles who were trying to keep the little children from coming near him. He said, let the little children come to me for such is the kingdom of heaven. What is there about a little child? No fear. No fear. Take the leap. My daddy will take care of me. Then we grow older and we forget that we have a daddy far, far more powerful than our earthly fathers. And we don't realize he will catch us. He will be with us to save us from taking the fall. 
Brethren, sometimes I think that we are just not using our brains. We're not, we're not trusting in God like we ought. We're not believing in his promises. We have so many blessings from God. I mean, unbelievable. We've already outlined a number of them today. Why do we not trust in him? When he says, come to me, give me your problems, give me your worries, give me your concerns, give me the things that you cannot possibly deal with, and I will give you an inner tranquility that human beings cannot explain. And we do not believe him. Where is our trust of a child? Where did we lose that? How did we lose that? What have we done to ourselves that we have forgotten that we have a father to help us? And strengthen us. Let's turn to the last point. One of the gifts that God gives us is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38, I quoted a moment ago. Every one of us as Christians receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What for? Well, for a number of reasons, but three, really. Number one, to comfort us. He covers us with his word. He covers us with his presence in our bodies. He supplies strength and power to us. He also provides intercession before the throne of God. Paul says he makes intercession with groanings that cannot be uttered before God in our behalf. He's praying for us. Christ is at the right hand of God, Romans 8, 34, making intercession for us every minute of every day of every hour. What have we got going for us? And then we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, a source of strength and power. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul prays He prays for the church. He says, I pray you may be strengthened with power in your inner man, in your inner being. What's he talking about? Power for what? Two things. The power to resist temptation. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil, God. Oh, Father, deliver us from evil. How do you think he does that? How do you think he does that? He does it through the, through the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells within us. He provides us with power and with strength. Later in that very prayer, in the last sentence, he says, Now unto him, almighty God, He says to them, you will experience power through the Holy Spirit with these words. Down unto him who is exceeding, gives us exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can possibly ask or think or imagine through the power that works within us. A power that works within us. Well, interestingly enough, one of the things that power does for us is help us to live and bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace. Peace, the opposite of fear. Peace, kindness, goodness, patience, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Through the Holy Spirit living within us, he helps us bear that fruit. We can never be successful totally in bearing that fruit without divine help. And that divine help is provided 
through the Holy Spirit. Remember Paul. Paul prayed three times in a thorn in the flesh. God, take it away, take it away, take it away. God said, no, no, no. Paul said, why, why, why? And God said to Paul, I want to introduce you to my power. My power, not your power. And then Paul said, using a word that's unbelievable, I now delight. He uses the word delight, not endure, not suffer. I delight in my persecutions, my hardships, in my difficulties, because when I am the weakest, I am the strongest. Because it's not me that's doing it anymore. You can't overcome addiction with that power from an outside source. It's almost impossible. Well, we're addicted to sin. All of us. How do we overcome that? With the power of the Holy Spirit, we do it. We, God wants us to bear fruit for him. He wants us to be an example to others. In love and joy and peace and so on. Think of this. God gives us an inner peace if we'll just take hold of it. You know what adrenaline is in your human body? Adrenaline is a hormone produced by the adrenal gland. In a moment of crisis, it can give you supernatural strength. It's how women have been able to pick up of a car of a child because of adrenaline. The Holy Spirit living in us is our spiritual adrenaline and gives us power, power to be able to say no to Satan and yes to God. But we have to ask for it. How do I access this power? How do I gain that power? Four things. Number one, we have to recognize that we need help. How do I come to Jesus? I need forgiveness. And again, I need forgiveness that comes from God. I can't provide it. My good deeds will not offset my sins. I recognize I have a need. That's why I come to Christ. We have a need for the Holy Spirit for help in living day to day. And overcoming our fears. Overcoming our anxieties. We have to say, first of all, I have a need for help. Then you have a mindset. A mindset that, that says, I want to do what God wants me to do. Paul says, have your mind set on spiritual things, not earthly things. Romans 8. To yield to the power, to yield to it. Paul says, Professor Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, 19. Do not quench the spirit. Don't throw cold water on the spirit. Don't turn your back on the spirit. He's there for you. He will help you. And then finally, you pray. And this is your prayer. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Which of you fathers, if you have a son, and he asks for a fish, that you will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, you will give him a scorpion? If you then, through, though you are evil, you're far from perfect, have much more to give no much more to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to all who ask him? We have a billion dollars in the bank and we never write a check against it. How stupid. How ridiculous. God's promised us the Holy Spirit. 
He lives within us. He is our spiritual adrenaline. He gives us power to say no to Satan and yes to God. He gives us the ability to overcome our fears. And we do not take advantage of that. What have I said to you today? I've said to you that you need to recognize what God does for you. He tells us that we must change our focus from self to others. He tells us to come to him in prayer. Come in him in prayer and ask for his help. And he will give us an inner peace that will pass all understanding. Believe that. If you haven't tried it, it's there. And then the Holy Spirit, a gift from God. Jesus forgives us of our sins every day. Holy Spirit helps us to live without sin and without fear and to bear the fruit of the Spirit, every one of those nine things. But today we're talking about number three, peace, inner peace. Pray and ask God for help. When's the last time you went to God in prayer and said, God, I need your help. I need your strength. Give it to me. When have we done that? Most of us never. God does not want his children to fear, to experience anxiety, but to enjoy the peace which is beyond the human mind to explain. Listen, listen to what God has to say. When we don't read the Bible, we don't understand what he's telling us. We cheat ourselves out of such things as peace. May God bless every one of you. And I pray for your success in overcoming your anxieties and your fears. It's available if you take advantage of it. We're going to sing a song now. Is that a custom in this church? It's a song that invites you to come forward to express to our shepherds any fears, concerns that you might have. We're family. We help each other. We pray for each other. I believe in the power of prayer. Oh, how I believe in the power of prayer. I'll give you one example before I close. Doris and I, last April, went out to see the wildflowers in Breckenridge Road. I got some great pictures. I decided to drive all the way over to the road that connects Caliente with uh, Lake Isabella. And I got almost there and I ran into what I thought was snow but turned out to be ice. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, we were stuck on ice with no traction on our tires. At four o'clock, and we hadn't seen any traffic on that road all day. Except for those who looked at the flowers and obviously turned around and went back into Bakersfield, and we did not. We continued on east. We were stuck. It was 40 degrees. I was at 6,500 feet. What did we do? I said, God, we need help. And I don't know how we're going to get it. Nobody's traveling this road. But God, my phone doesn't work. I can't get a signal. We need help. Then we sat back and talked, and we had no anxiety. We had no fear. An hour later, somebody knocks on the window. It's a young man. And he rolled down the window, and he said, uh, you're stuck, huh? I said, yeah, we are. So he was there with his dad and his mother and his two little children to see the wildflowers like us. 
and did the same thing I did, came over to the road that would take us back to 58. Well, he tried, he and his dad tried to push me off, no good, no luck, no traction. So another car showed up, an older man and his wife, and the father and the other man went looking for help. An hour later, they returned. They had found a man who was up there just for the day and the night, who had a cabin there, not too far away, a few miles away. And he had a pickup truck. That's how he had got there, because the pickup truck could go over the ice. And he had a shovel. And he tried to get me loose, and he couldn't do it. So he said, I, I've got to get your car up. So he got the jack out of the back. He jacked the car up. He had the shovel. He got the ice out from underneath it. And then he pulled the car back down, and they got in front and pushed. And by about almost 8 o'clock, I was off the ice. Turned around, some gentleman there. He, in fact, the man who did the, all the work, he got in my car, turned the car around, headed me back to Bakersfield. Don't tell me God doesn't answer prayers. On the way up there, I told Doris, anybody that drives this road at night is an idiot. I became an idiot <laughs> driving back down that road in total darkness. But look this. The gentleman who had, the first gentleman, he had a phone, and he was able to reach AAA. I had AAA. And he was able to reach AAA in my behalf. They couldn't figure out where I was, but they knew I was on Breckenridge Road. And as I went back down, I met a highway patrolman. He said, are you the man that was stuck? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, that AAA sent me up here in case you didn't get free. God answered my prayer two ways. Somebody to help me and somebody to save me in case they were not able to help me. My God is a great God. He's your God too. If you have a problem, a need for Christ, for your prayers, come while we stand and sing.